basically in all things in life, horn has an advantage over a string player in that you're like three times as loud, right? <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> and yep. you breathe for a living, so yeah. you're, you're very good at that. So. <laughs> Welcome to our pre-concert chat for our second concert in our Spotlight series. My name is Rachel Desor. I'm your principal cellist for Symphony Nova Scotia, and I'm joined here by Karis Sutherland, the new principal horn. Welcome, Karis. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, wonderful. This is like your first full season with Symphony Nova Scotia, right? Yes, yes. How's it going so far? It's going really well. I had a lot of fun on Symphony Week. It yeah. was really fun going around the province. Very cool. Mm. Did you have a connection to Nova Scotia before coming here? Yes, my whole dad's side of the family is from Halifax. My grandparents used to teach and work at Dalhousie. Um, and so I spent a lot of my childhood summers here in Halifax. And that was one of the things that drew me to taking the audition here in the first place. And I'm really happy that it all worked out and it feels very full circle to be living here now. Lovely. What were you doing just before you got here? I was finishing my last year of my undergrad at Juilliard. I graduated in the spring and now I'm here. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to play this concert and we're going to start with this piece called Repetitive Patterns of Inhale and Exhale. And I just have to say I'm very excited about this because mm. Stephanie Orlando is our winner of the Maria Anna Mozart Award. Mm. and Every time this award is given, a female or non-binary identifying composer mm -hmm. writes a piece just for us and we get to premiere it. Oh. So I'm always excited, what's it going to be? <laughs> and we got the score a little bit ago so that mm -hmm. I could, we could study it, right? right? And I was looking at it and I was like, this is really different. And I think this is one of the things mm -hmm. that we really need the live music for because mm -hmm. it is, as we said, about repetitive breath patterns. And so there's a lot of mm -hmm. breath sounds in this music. Yeah. What did you notice about how we're gonna make those? <laughs> yeah, I've seen a couple contemporary pieces from the last couple years. It seems like there's an interest in the sounds that the instruments make that are not what we associate with their traditional kind of timbre. And so I've seen a lot of like blow through the horn and wiggle your fingers or blow through the mouthpiece and make air noises that way, uh, which is really fun as a performer to do these extended techniques. And I was wondering how that works for the strings because you don't breathe into the instruments. What do the parts look like for you for pieces like that? Yeah, it really depends, but it's usually different versions of what they call white noise, which is mm. in the case here and it's just tends to be about a different way of placing your fingers so they don't create a pitch and different bow techniques to make that sound. Mm. I'm always curious how it's going to work. I think Stephanie actually really did it really well and it will work. Mm. But I'm really excited looking at the score also at the textural differences because while we're making these breathing sounds, there's also mm. like, there's a very rich percussion part mm. and there's like all these small gestures compared with these long gestures. Mm. I, I, I have a feeling, I don't know, we'll see, but mm. I have a feeling that's kind of what's special about Stephanie's music. Mm. Yeah, I'm really excited. Yeah. So our second piece on the program is Shostakovich, Cello Concerto Number 1. Mm. This yeah. one is very famous for horn players, as we'll see in a minute. Yes, mm. I was going to ask you about that. What about this mm. wonderful horn solo? It's, it's interesting how much Shostakovich uses the solo horn. There's only one horn part in this piece also, which is not typical. You'll always find at least two, a high and a low, to complement each other. But this is just one horn and it's in a lot of ways an equal partner sometimes to the cello soloist. So kind of back and forth. The first movement is based on this theme and the cello introduces it and then towards the end I'm just playing it really loud over and over. <laughs> <laughs> Which is typical for Shostakovich, who really loves to use brass and horns to represent kind of the oppressive powers of the time that he was living. So namely the Soviet Union, he was quite critical of the Soviet Union, but in a kind of a sneaky way. And so you can hear a little bit of that, I think, in this piece and how warlike it is. And the first movement is essentially a march. So 
Yeah, but I wanted to ask you as a cellist, your history with this piece. Have you ever studied it? Have you ever performed it? Yeah, it's actually one of the few cello concertos I've ever performed with orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, I, after I left Juilliard, I went to Oberlin. Mm -hmm. They had a concerto competition, and so I was one of the winners, and I got to play this piece. Mm -hmm. I, I was really interested because you know, a lot of time with concerto, especially cello concerto, we're not that loud and we're mm. all fighting against the orchestra and it's just like this huge sea of symphonic writing and then the cello like barely audible. Mm. And Shostakovich, I don't, he's probably smart so he knew this, but also it works for his writing to have it more as a chamber concerto, like mm. little pockets of the orchestra make statements and there's not often a big wash of sound that you have to fight through. Right. That being said, the cello part is incredibly aggressive. It's almost <laughs> really loud. There's tons of double stops. I was actually just looking at my music today and I was like, how did I ever play this? It's so <laughs> athletic. And the third movement is entirely a cadenza. It's really long. It's as, it's as if you're playing a solo sonata in the middle of a piece, but it's all incredibly intense and incredibly beautiful. The second movement still gets me every time. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to hearing that oh, yeah. from the rule of not having to worry so much <laughs> about so many <laughs> big notes and just counting. <laughs> yeah. A lot of counting in Shostakovich. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> A lot of counting. Also in our third piece, actually, Appalachian mm. Spring, I've played that twice, but I think I've played the sweet version. I've mm. never played the full ballet. Mm. And the last time we played it, we didn't have a conductor which is a little odd, I think, for the piece. Yeah. And it really made me realize, which doesn't happen often, why we need a conductor. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the intimate knowledge you would have to have of that score to mm. even like come in, because the, it's not in 4-4 four, four time, it's not regular beats all the time. It's mm -hmm. somewhat unexpected, and yet it sounds completely normal. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you about the differences between the two versions of Appalachian Spring. There's one a kind of arrangement for full orchestra, and then the original is a chamber ballet orchestra that I'm not in, there's no brass, it's just strings and winds. And I wanted to ask you, since I've never played either version, about the differences you find between the two. It's a good question. I've actually never played the full version either. Mm. I think I've only played the chamber version. Mm. Um, and I've only played the suite, which is like a selection. So I actually right. tried to do my homework and I, I watched the ballet. I was like, oh, it's a ballet. We're playing the whole thing. I should see. So I went on the YouTube and of course, you know, Public Television of America in 1958 created <laughs> an entire video for you to watch. Oh. So check it out um, with Martha Graham in it, mm -hmm. who it was written for. And I was like, oh, every time we got to a part that's like not in the suite, I was like, what's that? Why, why am I hearing something I don't expect? <laughs> And so it was just longer. I would imagine the orchestral version basically just feels larger and, mm. and more filled out. And maybe that would actually kind of work. Yeah, I mean, he's so American, like the quintessential <laughs> American composer. And you just think of the vast landscapes of America and the prairies and this kind of aesthetic of the era he was living in, particularly the 40s when this piece was written, kind of wartime and immediately post-wartime America is just such a distinct place and he really encapsulates that musically, which I think is so interesting. But yes, as you said, this piece was written to be a ballet and it was commissioned by Martha Graham, who's kind of the be-all end-all of dance. <laughs> and. <laughs> Um, she and Copeland were very good friends, also not just collaborators, and I think that the main relationship we see in the ballet, which is between the wife and the husband in this new farmhouse, I think a lot of that relationship reflects the relationship between Aaron Copeland and Martha Graham, and I think you can really hear it in the piece, how heartfelt it is. You can hear how much love there was there not just for the dance art form and before her as a person. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Well, I'm sad you're not playing it, but I guess <laughs> you get too. to hear it from the <laughs> I know, I'm excited. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching this pre-concert chat and we hope to see you there. <laughs>